It's okay, you do it, you do it. So you still got to tell them what to do? There you go. Okay, so I can see. I'm really glad to be here with you. We came back here to make this historical movement. Your participation as a pastor in this movement back in I mean, the 70s, but not even. I, I remember those times when uh, we were trying to get the churches and others to contribute money for the person supporting uh, the stri uh, strikers, and uh, we were somewhat successful. Uh, and the effort uh, at that time, that was a question of whether or not it would be successful, but we, we, we hung in there, we did what we had to do. And all the credit goes to the strikers who, uh, who gave of themselves for that great effort. And we're so glad to be here to uh, recognize them today. Well, it's historical that in Rocky Mount that we're still having this same movement and that we've just uh, now been on the city council and having our first black African-American city manager and having our first black party having our first, having now, not only a black fire chief, but a black police chief, and seeing how Rocky now that what you did back then is still pushing us forward, and that we as pastors and leaders now, and we have three pastors on the city council. That's, that's remarkable. As it has been said many times, we stand on the shoulders of others. Yeah. And because of the efforts of so many people over a long period of time, even before I came on the yes. scene, that uh, progress is being made and we're just so thankful to God for all those who uh, give of themselves for the purpose of making things better for all. Well, I want to thank you, man. I okay. look forward to this. Yes. Much, much. Not only we make history for us, now we're going to maintain history going forward. Thank you. So thank you. could be picked up by them. 
the residents complained to the city, and Mr. Evans returned the suit to his supervisor the following day. But on July 5th, Mr. Evans was suspended by the city and charged with misdemeanor larceny. What followed was the sanitation worker strike of 1978, which went on from July 10th to September 25th. After 40 years, the city of Rocky Mountain apologized to the family of Mr. Alexander Evans and the sanitation workers for actions taken by city government in 1978. And thanks to the Phoenix Historical Society, Mrs. Evans, the sanitation workers, and a host of others, we are finally telling their story. I am your host, Tamika Keenan Norman, and we understand the subject matter of this show might be uncomfortable for some, but our intent is to educate you and to hope you will always remember our history, no matter the level of comfort. I hope you'll enjoy this special edition of City Beat. We were married for 50 years. I say he was a good man. He loved to help people. For a while he was quiet, wouldn't talk. Very few words. But after he, we got married, couldn't shut him up. <laughs> he was a quiet uh, kind of a, a very strong uh, person. Uh, we, uh, we had a very good, good a, per, a personal uh, interaction relationship. I'll give you an uh, example. I, when I was a little uh, smaller and younger, I was a martial artist, and I would teach uh, uh, martial arts in the, in, in the community where he lived in Blue Hill. Uh, and uh, some, of, uh, some of the parents there, not many, <laughs> really led by one, who were saying, you know, you're teaching our children violence, you know, martial arts, right? And Ellen, who was respected, uh, and this was around 1982, uh, 83, Ellen, who had, had had any martial arts training, he came uh, on the floor and went into a, a martial arts stance <laughs> uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to indicate that he felt his training was good. He split his pants when he when he went to went to, went to the training. But th this was the kind of person, you know, who when he saw something that was right, he's gonna find a way to identify it with it and support it. And that's what he did. We we, we would laugh about this all the time. Uh, uh, Alex said, "God knows, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to use it, but God knows I need it." We would go to work, we had three collectors and a lot of times we didn't have a two. So he started the prayer thing on the back of the truck before we went to work. Because he knew what truck me. So man, that was his way of comforting me. And it worked. Came to know that he was a very humble, uh, very sincere type person. And uh, he struck me as being one who would not create a kind of disturbance unless there was uh, adequate reason. I knew he had made it in my life. And I can describe him as no better friend. And he had it in my life. He was good, he was good, God was saying, I guess all the good talkers. And uh, we're friends. And uh, you know, real friends with John. I said, why can't you like it? He loved me. That's what I'm doing. Kind of initial shock of him telling me what had happened. And I thought about it and I could see, as I said, I could see the seriousness on his face about it. Uh, you know, I practiced criminal law at the time, and so I heard, and I still hear many terrible things uh, about crimes and criminal activity. So, uh, but I can always tell somebody who's sort of a novice, understand, understand. Evans was certainly a novice. Uh, I can tell you he's not a criminal. I knew Mr. Evans, well, when I Worked. He came there maybe about three or four months after that day. And he was working with me as a team. And uh, we all got to know him. And he always talked to us about the Lord. Right? And 
So we young guys, so you know, we didn't want to hear it, but that's what he always did. And he 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 carried himself in a very way that we all had respect for him. And uh, that's why when when they say that he stole something, right? Nobody, none of us believed that because we knew he wasn't. While many described Alexander Evans as a man of God, after all his nickname was Alexander Preacher Evans, he was also now depicted as a thief by others. In addition to the suit, Mr. and Mrs. Urban Pennell complained they were also missing three neckties and two pairs of trousers. Mr. Evans said he never saw those items. On July 10th, workers didn't begin work on time, demanding a meeting with then city manager, Bill Bachelor. On July 11th, workers didn't start until meeting with the city manager and the mayor at the time, Fred Turnage. Workers wanted an apology from the city and for the charges to be dropped. Charges a group called the Concerned Citizens Association said were not brought forth from the alleged victim, but a police officer instead was responsible for Evans' indictment. The workers said at the meeting, they were given the understanding that charges would be dropped against Mr. Evans by a certain date. Because I didn't even know anything happened to Mr. Evans. One of the co-workers that worked with me, he was from Parker, and me, he rode with me to come to work. So he told me one day, he said, he said, uh, did you hear what happened to Mr. Evans? I said, no, I haven't heard anything. He said, well, they accused him of stealing, and they suspended him. I said, no, no, no. I said, how can you do that, right? And so the next morning, we confronted the supervisor. And Basically, they told us it wasn't on our concern. Don't worry about that, right? But we said, I said, well, I told the guys, no, we, we can't, we're not going, we can't do that because Mr. Evans, everybody knew Mr. Evans, and nobody, nobody, none of us even believed that he stole it because the article there in the telegram from no room, it gives him, he tells them that, how he gets stopped from from pulling from working on the job store and taking and donating to people that didn't have. So there's a great article in the river. Then three months later they come back and get us made to be nothing. Phil was always throwing stuff away, I mean good stuff. And um, they threw him in it, whether it worked or not, they put it out. And uh, when he brought that suit home, um, I said, what did you bring this here for? You should have left it in the trash. He said, tell me, what's wrong with it? I said, it looked like somebody been wearing it for years and it, need, it looked like it was already in the trash and it need cleaning. You know, like you wear a white shirt and the collar, you wear it so many times the collar gets dirty back there. That's the way that collar was on that white suit. And he was, he was just messed up. I said, you need to take this back. I said, ain't nobody gonna wear this. And uh, before he could take it back, he came and told me, he said, what you do with that suit? I said, I said, it's over there somewhere. And uh, he said, I got to take it back. I said, for what? I said, what are they going to do with it? <laughs> but um, in a way, that's the beginning of what was going on. They were setting him up, you know, and everything. So, he took the suit back down there. And uh, he, he was gonna give that suit away to, to people. He, he'd get folk you away, throw out clothes and stuff like that. He'd give it to people that he knew that needed them. That's what he did with them. That's the kind of man he was, like to help people. Even though he didn't have much out of sales, but he always saw fit to help somebody else. After failed attempts, the sanitation workers walked off the job July 25, 1978, receiving assistance from groups like the Concerned Citizens Association, led by Reverend Thomas Walker, the NAACP, led by local leader Reverend Albert Lee, the North Carolina Trade Union Educational League, the African Liberation Support Committee, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led by its local leader, Naomi Green. Concerned Citizens Association was uh, formed uh, out of a crisis that had happened uh, with the city council 
uh, their appointment uh, of a representative to the uh, Chamber of Commerce. It was uh, Mr. Clarence Wiggins at that time that was serving, and uh, they took him off primarily um, because of him being too bold. So uh, we, we organized and, and saw that we needed to have a group to speak to. Uh, to to these kind of issues, we were always involved. We were involved in various kinds of activities, and since this uh, came to be, uh, there was no nothing else for us to do but to respond and to share that struggle. What really got me involved with this, um, the committee of the sanitation workers uh, came to me and asked me if, uh, and then they told me the issue. They told me what had happened. And they asked me if I would aid them by uh, leading them in some, um, uh, some work of, of trying to get Mr. Uh, Evans to uh, work his job back. And you know, so get him exonerated and all this kind of thing. So I felt, I felt so impressed with the sanitation workers. They, they were, had a lot of courage. They were sincere, but they also were hurting because they knew that they had families to feed and they were really concerned about it. So I, I tried to rally the community together as well as the church uh, to, to offer them assistance. The other thing was they were going to charge me drive by July 24th at 4.30 p.m. that Monday. And when it, that money came and the charge had not been dropped, and Mr. Evans was still scheduled to go to court on the 27th, the next day, uh, the workers, uh, led by Larry Giles, uh, said, we're going to strike. Because we can't, uh, you know, we haven't got any results, and we can't work on, on these conditions. So they went on strike, and they went on strike uh, that time from Tuesday to the following Monday. And that Sunday, they had a march from Weeks Armstrong project to Thompson Park. When charges weren't dropped, the Concerned Citizens Association organized a march July 30th from Weeks Armstrong to Thompson Park and on August 20th from City Lake to Thompson Park. According to Reverend Walker, over a thousand people participated, plus the group organized a protest of downtown businesses. Well, negotiation had, uh, had broken down. Uh, and in our opinion, it, never should have been negotiation because the incident should never have happened. Uh, you know, Mr. Evans was simply doing his job um, and uh, even though it wasn't a uh, written um, a rule, it was a practice rule that if you didn't want something, uh, you would put it in and near the trash can. And so he picked up these clothes and uh, Mr. Bachelor uh, allowed uh, the person who clothes the clothing to, to take out a warrant on him. And uh, so we just felt that, okay, that, that's the issue. But why did we work hard? Uh, because we really were, we were powerless. And uh, we also were very much in tune to our national leader. Uh, who's my little kid? It was just really one, protest. just one protest. Um, we chose different businesses, and the uh, reason we chose those businesses, as I just stated, because uh, we didn't have any, we had no political power, but we, we knew we had economic power. And we knew that the, uh, the businesses uh, had a voice with the political power, which we didn't. I didn't do nothing. I knew the situation that he was in, and and, and I knew that uh, well, nothing much I could say about it because he was within his rights. Well, from what I said, he was within his rights, and so. He had all these people coming out to help him because they didn't want to write either. 
and uh, so I just wherever they went, I tried to be with him in the march and everything. When I approached the city manager about it and tried to get him to uh, bring it to an end, he told me it was out of his hands, it was now in the courts. But I think the sanitation workers stuck together because there were some other underlying problems within the division of sanitation. We've been having meetings, when I said we, the, the Human Relations Department had been meeting with some of the employees to discuss uh, some of their concerns so that we could uh, relay those concerns back to the city manager with hopes that uh, some correction would take place. Others believed in Mr. Evans too and thought he and the other sanitation workers were not treated fairly. Even before the Concerned Citizens Association, there was one woman who fought for the workers and showed them her support. Naomi Green was a civil rights activist. She was a community uh, advocate agency. She was a community organizer, and she was a freedom fighter worker for the sanitation workers in the 1978 strike. Um, when the strike took place, I was 20 years old. Um, and my thoughts was, um, I was, I was young, but my thought was, okay, my mom was trying to set its um, example for her kids to know right from wrong and to do right from wrong, but most of all, learn how to treat people, know how to treat people, um, as far as from the higher places to the lowest. Um, and then also my mom would go from your door, your house door, to the courthouse door. The day that we, the first time that we decided we were going to work there, she was the first person that came up where we were working. She said, she said, I'm so proud of you boys, she said, it's time for somebody to stand up against the city of Rocky Mountain. And she said, all y'all got to do is stick together. She said, don't let nobody separate y'all. She said, y'all just stick together. She said, I got to go and do something for my kids. And she said, I'll be back and talk to y'all some more. Because she was the first one out of the community that came up and, and, and actually supported us. Carla G. Woodson, who indicated that the, talking about the black church, indicated that the black church was the, the school, the drama place, the gymnasium. In fact, the, the black church was sort of the, the pillar of the community. And they looked to the church to provide many kinds of services. There was always that kind of pull from the community thinking that the church should always be in the center of change. In terms of the church, the uh, Mount Pisgah Presbyterian Church, there was some participation. It was a church where you had predominantly professional people involved. And normally when there is a church with that many professional people in, Realizing that some are doctors, nurses, and uh, attorneys, so that involvement on a personal basis during the, the protests may not take place, but their contributions and their help in terms of strategizing for the movement uh, was there. So there was some help within the church. The main thing is that the church did not prohibit me from being part of the, of the movement, and that's always important. Um, one of the things that I did not have to go through, because the Presbyterian Church during that time, also through its national missions, supported the local church in making sure that the pastor had an adequate salary. So I could feel a little more free being involved because I did not have to feel the uh, Repercussions. The community responded in a way 
let me, let me see if I can explain what I mean. You had persons who would contribute to the protest, but would not actually either come to the meetings or be on the line during the protest. Uh, we did have some persons who were uh, involved in the in the parade or the, the protest. Um, but generally during that time, you gotta think about this was in the in the seventies. You didn't get a large number of the community, the African American community, involved in kinds of struggle directly. Uh, but they were involved, but not directly. Um, it's always been that few, as I said before, many times persons who maybe had the most to lose were the ones who actually made a difference in the movement. The community and other sanitation workers showed support for Alexander Evans and all workers who wanted equal rights but didn't know where their next meal was coming from. In fact, there were some organizations that understood and a campaign began to solicit $1 a week from every working person in the city with donations being turned over to the strikers. The NLSCP uh, during that time played a very important role. Uh, Reverend Dr. Lee, uh, Elbert Lee, the pastor of the Missionary Baptist Church. He was the president for over 32 years here in Rocky Mountain. But he held two mass meetings at the North End Missionary Baptist Church. And it was his church uh, that sponsored the play sales. And those play sales were, were uh, money raised uh, from the community uh, to help the sanitation workers during that time was on strike to help pay their bills and to provide uh, uh, finances for their family. And so it was very, very important. Um, the NAACP was, was very active. If they hadn't walked well, out and had done it about it, they did a lot of people did a part of them to do the same thing. We might have done the same thing. I don't know. We might have. But I thought right there to walk off and get, get, get straight. You think you think you might have done it. Get my understanding of what we're talking about. Make sure you don't leave what it's in. You want to do it. Don't go out and leave what it's in. You do what we had to do. Well, at that particular time, when the strike happened, I didn't notice it either. But uh, I knew our rights were violated, and so that's why I walked out. I'm scared when I think about it, because uh, my kids was three, four years old. <laughs> so. But uh, yeah, I just gave it all up. Well, yeah, yeah, I tell you, I knew him all that time, and I knew that Eddie could not take nothing on his anyway. And we had an understanding that whatever was at the garbage can with the media, put it on it, he did that, take it on And why I see that way, well, he was taking it up because I caught what the rules were for the city. And I know we had everything come on, it was done. It was a man that would take stuff that wouldn't even take but get stuff. And uh, he had to clean or whatever it may be, he was to somebody else. But I feel the real heroes in this whole strike is the young guys that made the sacrifice to clean Mr. Evans' name. And also the community of Rocky Mountain. Because every time we went out on strike, we didn't get paid. And we used to have rallies, and people came out, families came out, and people would give them nickels and dimes of quarters, right, to try to help us. You know? So they are the real heroes because we never could have done it without community support. I wasn't concerned about how my bills going to get paid, and they got paid. That was a miracle. I think the city didn't handle it. I, I think the city could very easily have compensated the homeowner and then looked into the situation and would have found what they eventually found anyway. That was the evidence that my stole that suit. When the strike underway, trash was piling up at residents' homes and a trial had not yet occurred. Then two attorneys, Quentin Sumner and Antonia Lawrence, came on the scene. Well, I'm Quentin T. Sumner. Uh, I'm now a senior resident spiritual judge for Nash County. 
And at the time, I was a practicing attorney in Rocky Mount. That was in 1978, and I had been licensed in 1975, and so I was newly admitted to practice of law. I was sitting in my office in July of 78, and my secretary came in and said, these gentlemen need to see you. And of course, I invited them to my office, and it was Alexander Evans, uh, Leonard Giles, I believe, and Rudolph Edmondson, and I think Lucille Pittman, and English Edmondson, I believe, were the gentlemen who came to see me. So I thought it was just a routine visit by some people from the community. So I had no idea it had anything to do with the case. But uh, after talking to them, I understood that Mr. Evans had a problem. And I don't know if Mr. Giles did most of the talking, as I recall. But obviously at that time, it was very heavy on Mr. Evans' mind that he was involved in a criminal matter, which was something new to him. I could tell just by looking at it. So that's how I got involved. It, and I, I didn't know any significance about it. Point other than the fact that it was a case, I was a lawyer, and I had a client, a potential client. I spoke to Bill Bachelor in those days, and uh, we had a very long conversation, and it was his position, as he said, that, as the paper said, that, that was, from the city's standpoint, they felt that they could not intervene. I understand how the criminal process works, and the city was also, they had an interest in this matter, not just the person who had, the homeowner was sued and been taken, but the city was involved. And in those days, my trash was not being collected like everybody else's. And I wanted my garbage to move. And I spoke to Bill Bachelor, I spoke to the DA, who became a good friend of mine. We were not that close in those days, but through the years we became very good friends. Uh, and I spoke to the lead investigator for the uh, city police department. And they all were just adamant that they were not going to dismiss this matter. And being a fresh young man I was, and still in the day, I, my position was, I'm going to take you to court. The case was first heard at a preliminary hearing when Mr. Evans was found guilty in district court. Workers once again walked off to protest the ruling and continued on strike until August 31st. Then a successful strategy finally exonerated Mr. Evans. It was what we call a preliminary hearing. And I had discussed this with him and told him that I did not think our prospects with that particular point in the process were going to be very good. I knew the judge was going to hear the preliminary matter, and it's nothing more than a forecast what the state believed the evidence was. And I didn't want to do it, but I felt I had to do it to him. I had to get him accustomed to being in court, speaking in front of a judge and other people. So I went ahead, I guess I've got a judgment in mind, and I, I allowed him to go to the preliminary hearing. I put him on at the preliminary hearing, and the judge at that point could have, after hearing the evidence from the state, which was the forecast of what they had, and my forecast of what my defense would be, would be able to make the judge make a determination that he could dismiss the case at that point. But I was not looking for that. Uh, I think Mr. Evans was looking for that, but I was not. Uh, I practiced law, as I said, and I knew the judges, and I knew the propensity of what things they could do and what they were not going to do. And the judge we had was not going to do that. There was no way in the world he's going to dismiss that case at that point. And so I didn't reveal all of my strategy at that point. Uh, I really wanted to see what the state had at that point, basically. So it's, it's really like a fishing expedition for both the state and for the defendant. It's a cat and mouse game at that point. So show me your cards, and I'll show you one of my cards, which is what I did. And then let me do this. I, I need to give, in terms of strategy, I need to give due deference to my law partner, who's deceased now. Antonio Lawrence, uh, he, he and I tried the case together. And obviously I have to say that a great deal of credit goes to the attorney, but I could not have gotten through without him. And I, want to, I really want to take time to acknowledge his, his work, his, his great work ethic, and his little mind. Um, but back to the point of strategy, I, as I said, as I interviewed the workers, Mr. Evans, all of them, I saw a pattern. These gentlemen were picking up trash and things that you and I discard on a daily basis. They were picking up because one man's trash is another man's treasure. And that's what they did. They collected stuff as they went about their daily business. Things that I don't particularly want that I want to discard. They see that and they're able to refurbish it, use it, and restore it and move on. And that was the pattern that this is what these gentlemen did. So, I was asking them about the types of things that they were collecting. 
and I think the usual stuff like, you know, we got plates, we got fans, um, we got electric heaters, and one guy said, well, I got a TV set one time, and my ears immediately perked up. I said, you got a television set? And I said, please describe the set for me. He said, it was a console, and it was a color set. I said, it's my three weird color television set. He said, yes. I said, I said, what was wrong with it? He said, well, it only needed, uh, in those days, two, this is the stage your time, I'm old. Uh, television had tubes in those days, in the old days, not what they have now. But it only needed a tube, and so you put a tube in it, and it's working. So I said, where's the set now? He said, oh, it's in my house. I said, well, I want you to bring that television set when we try this case, the Superior Court. And so I raised them, bring the set, and I kept them out in the ante room outside the courtroom until it was time for us to put on the on our defense. Of course, the state goes first. They show all their cards. They put their, their witnesses on. And then it was time for us to do an eye case. And after I put Mr. Evans on, I put on a couple of the workers, and we talked about what they did, the things they collected. And I got the gentleman on who had the television set. And I said, tell me something else you sort of collected. He said, well, I got a television set one time. So I said, describe it. He described it. And I said, well, um, where's the set in? He said, it's in my house. And I said, well, would that Said, help you describe the type of things you got? He said, sure, it was. So I turned around at that point. I made a motion to rear the whole room. Had four, four the workers bring this console TV down the aisle. And the judge went berserk. I mean, he was like, hit the TV, bang the gavel. Get that TV set out of here. Get that TV set out of here. Well, I was like, oh, Judge, excuse me. Also, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, sir, Judge. Anything you say, you know. <laughs> but the whole idea was I wanted the jury to see what this particular television set. And I must say myself, it was a brilliant stroke of my legal genius. <laughs> Mr. Evans uh, and all of the sanitation workers were uh, black, but uh, they had no record of any of the employees, not only Mr. Evans, ever taking anything from the uh, home in which they were serving. I was shocked at what people throw away, like televisions, uh, exercise equipment, uh, and the, those guys oftentimes would take that equipment and rebuild it. And when they brought all of that into the court on the appeal, I don't think the judge could believe what he was seeing. Matter of fact, he asked them to stop bringing in stuff to prove their point. Well, I went over, one time I went around my phone, big color TV. I forget, I think it was 25 feet, I believe. There were two people, one man and a half, and it took two or three kids. And I got the, got, got the TV, no problem. Two, two of them in New York, got it, no problem. That was a game, but that was me, I don't know, that was a little bit fun, two people, but you still got the TV. I don't know what. Mr. Evans was found not guilty September 25th, 1978. But his case and the sanitation worker strike of 1978 was only the start of more diversity. Voters' rights and organizations like the Rocky Mount City Workers Association, Black Workers for Justice, Legal Services, and more. One of the things that was was put out in the press statement on August 30th when the strike ended was the the unfair voting system here in Rocky Mount, electing city council, where the people from various wards, it, it was not, they didn't have a uh, proportional representation for the African American community, which uh, was over 40% of the population. They had a system where most all the African Americans were in one ward, and then the whole city voters get to vote on who's going to represent that ward, not just the people in that ward. So it was like, uh, so at that time, the white majority voters were, they were picking who was going to represent the African ward. So you had one uh, African city council, but he's being elected by, you know, the white majority. And so it's an unfair proportional system. Uh, right, Rocky Mountain was one of the nine cities in North Carolina that had that kind of unfair um, election system for city council. So uh, it, was, it was put out then, on August 30th, uh, 1978, that the, the struggle is not over, it's just beginning. And they, they were wanting to struggle to change the way Rocky Mountain elected city council. And that was eventually uh, done in 19, 
83 by a voting rights suit that was led, Lee Clayton was the only Green, and also joined by several members of the Black Works for Justice, which is another organization that, that, that came in the wake of the sanitation worker struggle. And Alexander Evans was the first chairperson of the Black Works for Justice. And they had several, their members were also plaintiffs in the voting rights suit. And it was a story because it, it changed the way we elect the city council in Rocky Mountain to a proportional fair ward system um, where the people of each ward uh, elect their own representative. It was out of that experience that uh, voter registration started and we saw the importance of us having uh, political power even though it started with faith based community it ultimately spread throughout Within our struggle was a lady called Naomi Gray. Uh, Naomi was not uh, a flashy person. She just had, she had hard go and she had a determination. She was a, she could protest and she like a bulldog. She, she once she get a hold of it, she, she held it. And so she was meeting with uh, the fellas and encouraging them. And uh, every now and then she would drop a word about if we had somebody on that council that was like what we would have to do all this. Well, we were listening to her with one ear and to the fellows with the other ear. So out of that, we decided to simultaneously uh, start a voter registration drive and uh, move towards, we started eliminating people from the council. But all of it was born out of this, this struggle. When my mom was 15 years old, she was transporting people to the polls to exercise their rights about um, voting. And even though she was put out of the polls because she was so young, but, my, but her father would let her use the car to still exercise that right. And ever since then, it has been, you know, she has been on the battlefield for just justice and civil rights for um, you know, from that time up until now. She was just an all-around person. She would give you the clothes on her back um, if she needed to. She just was a, a freedom fighter, a worker for justice. Yeah, I think from the, from the strike, you, you know, it really was a combination of, uh, of several things. Uh, if we look back uh, in 1968, I think in February, um, the sanitation department in Memphis, uh, who uh, was marching for um, uh, higher wages, you know, it was poor wages and poor working condition. And so seeing that during that period of time in the 60s, and then it was 10, 10 years later, uh, Rocky Mountain faced um, with the same uh, plight as other southern cities, uh, African American working in jobs of poor condition and low wages. And so we can see it coming to full circle. And so from, from, from that strike, uh, I think the people continued to galvanize and demanded the city that we would go to a war system. And then they have representation that the city of Rocky Mount would have representation that murals the demographics of Rocky Mount. And I think that was in uh, I forgot what month, but it was in 78, might have been in January of 1978, that uh, Ms. Hawkins, Desmarella Hawkins, approached the city council and said, that, you know, we have an at-large system and we only have one African-American, which was Reverend Dudley, uh, on the city council, and that uh, this city should go to a war system, that we would have more African-Americans uh, to represent um, the city on on the board. And so I think those things um, all play a part in um, the strike and, and, and working for better working condition and quality of life for, for the citizens here in Rocky Mountain. During the uh, 78 strike, it's my understanding, I, 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 I came down in 81, but during the 78 uh, a strike, uh, which I I researched and 
I talked to Elvick and a number of other workers who were there at that time. Uh, uh, there was an at-large voting system here, which meant that uh, people uh, uh, who ran for city council uh, supposedly uh, uh, were uh, became ward, ward representatives of the council. However, uh, uh, they were voted at large. That meant, you know, that uh, 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 if if uh, because of the racism in North Carolina as a part of the Jim Crow uh, in the South, they were able to identify a black a person who they would elect, who they felt was acceptable uh, to their general direction or policy. But there will always be a white majority. The 1983 voting rights suit of Naomi Green versus the city of Rocky Mount resulted in a fair and racially proportional ward system by which the Rocky Mount City Council is elected. All right, the purpose of the Rocky Mount City Workers were to organize so that we can have a better voice within the community and within our uh, city. It was formed in 1994, but it got its roots in 1978. Well, some of the things that we uh, basically looked at was uh, unfair uh, firing, unfair hiring, and uh, low wages, uh, promotion. Because of Alexander uh, Evan, who was one of the sanitation workers, he got uh, got with us and told, talked to us and gave us, spoke to us about how we should organize a, and get together as a unit instead of uh, being divided. We should come together so in order that we get together, we can have a better voice uh, together instead of separate. Alexander Evans. 
and um, there was, you know, uh, efforts, you know, to expand uh, what happened in Rocky Mountain uh, to other uh, parts of eastern North Carolina. I would like to share with you what the a person from the Historical Society in summing up what may have taken place, and I'd like to read it if it's okay. The 1978 Rocky Mount Sanitation Workers' Strike set the foundation for modern labor and civil rights organizing in Rocky Mount, signaling a shift in how the labor movement functioned in North Carolina and the southeastern United States. The strike highlighted a winning strategy for labor activists, negotiating without a collective bargaining agreement through grassroots organizing, linking labor rights to civil rights, and rallying community support that influenced future labor organizations and organizing organizations in North Carolina, including the 1981 Kmart workers' struggle in Rocky Mountain. So from that conclusion that was drawn by uh, the persons who had uh, pulled together the facts and figures of the 1978 uh, sanitation strike uh, indicated that it made various kinds of inroads into that which led to a successful uh, struggle for the Kmart workers in Rocky Mountain in 1981, which was uh, just about three years later. After they finally settled the strike, I met with the sanitation workers, and uh, I remember very well saying, I want to talk with you about your conditions other than money. I'm not in a position to give you a raise or an increase. What else the city could do to make your job a little better and a little safer? Uh, I'd like to hear. And we sat down and uh, they talked about fear of someone running in the back of the uh, sanitation truck because it wasn't properly lighted. And uh, as I stated earlier about the fear of dogs and uh, some other things that they brought up that, uh, that I guess if you weren't doing that kind of work, you would not think about. Uh, the night that we issued the city council uh, the adoption of the resolution, uh, in that spirit of humility and justice, um, seemed like the spirit was moved in the council chamber um, that we would issue an apology as a city, uh, apologizing for what the city had done to Mr. Evans, to the sanitation worker, to the entire city, um, to right or wrong. And during that time, it sort of moved upon me to say that we need to make an apology. And Councilman Blackwell agreed, um, second that motion, and it made several comments that uh, we as a city, if we're going to continue to prosper and grow, uh, that uh, that's the right thing to do. And uh, the entire council uh, voted uh, to approve the resolution and that we, as a city, will apologize uh, for the shameful and awful thing that we've done. Even though it had been over 40 years ago that we wanted to make what was wrong, right, for the city. The city manager during that time um, thought it upon himself that he was doing what was right, um, which was wrong, and it was out here to right or wrong. And um, I remember Walker mentioned about employees that were terminated. And so one of the things, apology also leads up to compensation. And so I think we need to take a look at uh, those that were uh, uh, fired and those that were displaced and, uh, uh, and right that as well. Well, you know, I think when things like that happened back uh, in the mid-70s, uh, you know, Mr. Baxter was an excellent city manager and did a great job in the city of Rocky Mount, so I, I assume he was following protocol at the time. Uh, I think when an event like that happens and we have complaints from citizens, we, we do try to take them seriously and investigate them. 
uh, whether hopefully the same event wouldn't happen again today. I mean, I still go back and think, you know, somebody put a super cloning down by the, by the street with, the, with their other tracks, and, you know, why would they carry one way or the other? I mean, I still have a hard time with that. You know, I went around at the time, not the city council members that are serving today or were, um, you know, involved in city government at the time, but I think it does um, send a message that, you know, as a city, you know, maybe we can handle things differently. And uh, going forward, we want to be uh, mindful of things that have happened in our past that, so we don't go down those same roads again. I think it's just a significant event when workers put their jobs on the line for a co-worker. Um, workers who had no, it was no union backing them up. It was, it was of themselves and their, their commitment for justice for a co-worker. And they would put their lives on the line and span fast until victory was won and Mr. Evans was exonerated. Um, it's just uh, a rare, a rare event. I don't see people um, willing to do that. And it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of faith. For the city of Rocky Mountain, for the city council, I have an encouraging word for them is that I appreciate them doing the resolution. I saw a light. I saw when we were going through the struggles we had, there was no diversity, okay? But when I walked into the city council chamber that night, I was real apprehensive because I didn't know what to expect. Right? But after the city council passed the resolution, it just showed me that the sacrifices that we made were well worth it because now I see a, a city council diverse. Down, down in the chambers, I see diversity. If we saw the strike of 78, would you have less or very few um, people of color, even in employment and management, upper management? Uh, now you can see today that through the employment, the management, that we have a diverse management and working population here in the city of Rocky Mountain. And I think from the struggle that we as a city and a civil rights organization uh, have gained a lot and have withstood the test of time and we can, uh, can see the works that was done and continue to be done, that it has become uh, fruitful and beneficial to all of us. Because of the sacrifice of Mr. Alexander Evans, the sanitation workers, and others at the time, the Phoenix Historical Society has worked hard to get a marker unveiling in their honor. I'm happy to report that the, the North Carolina Highway Historical Marker Advisory Committee has approved a state historical marker for the 1970 Rocky Mountain Sanitation Workers Strike. And it will be uh, located on Lake Avenue, the corner of Spruce Street and Atlantic, where the sanitation department was in the town of Strike. And also across the street from Thompson Park, where the rallies took place, and also across the street from the Mark King Mark that's there now. He went to the city, and he knew that the Lord sent him there. Because in the way where he would have worked at that place, because uh, he was a, what you call a clean man. He didn't even like get his hands dirty. And um, working on cars without any question. You know, I really had not with this case in over 30 something years. Uh, it's only to Mr. Wren, Jim Wren, brought my attention. I really forgot about it. And as I reflected on, my role with Mr. Evans' role, never being involved in it. Uh, it became, it took on a heightened sense of importance. I didn't see it at the moment. You know, you live the moment and you don't understand what really was going on. But in reflection, uh, I see the importance of it and the significance of it.
and it was in water. It was probably one of the earliest cases in workers' rights in eastern North Carolina, North Carolina, for that matter. Uh, so it was an important event. And I now play my part in it. Uh, the students and the workers deserve all the credit. But the thing about it, why can't we get together and do these things together? You know? I, I, I appreciate you guys back y'all coming by. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you want to get to out there, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I asked the question at one time, why? Why do these people want to keep it up here me? And then I thought about it. I said, it could be helpful to somebody else down. And here I am talking about the other people. Right. If somebody run into the crap that I run into, by you all writing this stuff, it might be able to, it might can get something from there that will help them in this day and time. That's the idea. Uh -huh. sure. So, so I, I, I can see it, you know, now, and, and, and I can appreciate you doing that because I, I like that, that song that somebody wrote, I don't know who wrote it, but I said, if I can't help somebody along the way, that's the question. I said, what good am I? He was a 
love the documentary as well. Also, uh, okay, Judge Quentin T. Sumner. Uh, Reverend Thomas Walker. He came all the way from Charlotte. Uh, Reverend Lloyd Morris. It's been so long since we take the documentary, Mr. Sam Bray said, I'm in. Mr. Sam Bray. <laughs> Let me take a picture, come on up. Thank you. 